I feel that if I would have had a mentor a little early on in my career, I, I would not have made so many business mistakes. I've never worked for somebody else. In my, I mean, I've worked my whole life for somebody else, but I could choose who it was. They were never in control of, of my work. Working for a boss, like all these people here in this office working for this company and this style and this thing, um, I, I miss that. I miss the fact that I've never had that experience of working for somebody else with their vision, their mentality and having to adapt myself to, to that on a consistent basis, uh, but also to not really having a mentor um, uh, following me in the, in, in the youth of my career. Welcome back to the Virtual Lighting Design Community Podcast, the show where we dive deep into the world of lighting design and bring you insightful interviews with industry professionals. Today's episode is dedicated to one of our lighting heroes, Kurt Vermeulen. Kurt, who is number 14 on David Gilby's renowned list of lighting heroes, is an exceptional lighting designer who constantly pushes the boundaries of visual lighting. His work is nothing short of breathtaking, inspiring us and many others in the industry. From architectural lighting to light art pieces and even aerial light shows using drone-mounted lights, Kurt's creativity knows no bounds. In this episode, we had the privilege of interviewing Kurt, giving us a unique glimpse into the mind of this lighting hero. We explore his concept processes, his thoughts on storytelling through lighting, and his remarkable portfolio of projects. A great listen whether you are a seasoned professional or just starting your journey in lighting design. Now, before we begin, we'd like to express our gratitude towards our premium supporters who make this podcast possible. A big thank you to Aero Light, Creative Lighting Asia, Erco, and the Signified Lighting Academy for their unwavering support of the virtual lighting design community. If you're not already part of our vibrant lighting community, we invite you to explore what we have to offer at www.vld.community. It's a space where professionals and enthusiasts alike come together to share knowledge, collaborate, and stay updated with the latest trends and innovations in lighting design. Now, without further ado, let's dive into this inspiring conversation with Kurt Vermeulen and discover what makes him a true lighting hero. Kurt, welcome to our Lighting Hero series. Hi, Martin. Old. <laughs> we finally got there. All, all the way from, from Belgium. Um, I think is your na native uh, language, uh, Tom, is that Dutch as well? Or is that yeah. French? No, Dutch. it's Dutch. Okay. Yeah. So um, we, we, we both have a, a Dutch background and um, <laughs> uh, some family ties. Um, as you know, I, I was born in Holland, but from a French mother. So you are living in a country that has French and Dutch. So. Um, so I, I would love to, to uh, hear a bit more about your journey. Um, we, we have started this Lighting Hero series uh, with David Gilby. He, he wrote uh, quite a number of Lighting Heroes posts and we found it really interesting and wanted to dig a bit deeper um, into the personalities behind those Lighting Heroes. And uh, you were one of them and uh, here you are. So we're gonna talk a little bit about um, who is Kurt Vermeulen, uh, and and uh, go a bit through your journey from from your early days all the way to where you are today. So maybe you can start off by introducing yourself, um, where you are, where you were born, how you came into lighting, uh, that sort of uh, first step of your journey. Well, um, good um, well good, good morning or good evening or good afternoon to anybody that's listening at the moment. Um, you, you pronounced my name right, so I'm already happy with that. Uh, it's uh, Kurt Vermeulen, eh? because for the most of the English-speaking people, it's Kurt, because otherwise they just get lost with it. With the, for the, the French people say Kurt, uh, so this is whole thing. Uh, so thank you already for doing that. Um, my journey, I think my passion um, was in flames um, when I was 14 and a half years old. Um, by being in a room with a, um, you know, a, a tour manager at that point, 
um, who was in Belgium for a promo tour. And they were, uh, I mean, they hired us um, as a small rental firm. I had a, at 14 years old, so actually already a small rental firm for doing disco back, you know, little DJs going to parties and doing, uh, you know, with the... Uh, you were actually a DJ? You were actually a DJ at your... Yeah, your well, I, I, don't, I don't know. I wouldn't call myself a DJ. I put uh, records on, on a turntable and put the needle on it and change oh. the fader on the mixing table. Um, I wouldn't call myself a DJ. That's that's too much credit for, for what I was at that time. Hmm. Um, but the, um, you know, the main thing is, is I had this equipment and so... People in Antwerp, where I where I was where I lived at that time, and I was uh, I was born there, um, just you know, uh, cheap and easy to work with. So people hired us for small things mm -hmm. that we have to do. So this concert happened, and this tour manager came in, and he kind of took my disco equipment and put it in such a way and took all the filters away because it was typically red, blue, green, and yellow. Yeah, those. <laughs> typical color took all yeah, them away yeah. I mean white and only blue and uh, what used to be front light he put it as a, as a back di diagonal light and stuff like that and all of a sudden that kind of opened my eyes on what lighting was able to do and uh, and and it's been you know not consciously yet but I was so amazed by that that from that moment on lighting was my thing so I, I gave the DJ to my friends. Uh, they were doing that and during our parties. I was actually, you know, pulling the knobs and putting up the, uh, the lighting equipment. And, you know, going forward a couple of years, six, six years later, we were already really running a company. Uh, we were with three associates. We had already three people working for us. And we had some trouble with the tax people because we were doing everything <laughs> under the radar. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so they gave us this kind of thing where, you know, go and have a real company. Otherwise, you will be uh, not jailed. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you know, we were not really doing everything according to what it should be. And that's the start of my professional career. Um, I, I, I was still doing a little bit of architectural college at that moment. And so I went into this endeavor and I created my first company, which was a rental company for lighting and sound. And where my role was being commercial, um, I was the one talking to clients um, as the business, you know, role that I have. And as the technical role, my role was the lighting and the lighting design that had to do with that. Right, right. Five years along that way, uh, my three, my two other partners and myself we're no longer in full agreement on how we had to run this, this company. I wanted to have a full creative view. They wanted to make money. Um, it's not always compatible. I know that <laughs> now. Yeah, yeah. They say sometimes designers are not always good business people. And vice yeah. versa. <laughs> so we kind of split ways. I, I took my shares, you know, I sold my shares in that company and created the very first iteration of ACT uh, at that time. And ACT was um, is actually at that time art concept technology because those were kind of the three things that I pulled together to, for my, my work at that time, which was solely actually in entertainment, um, fashion shows and concerts and corporate stuff, um, all those kind of things. No television, no film. Yeah. I never did any you know, film, um, but that was like the yeah that was my beginning, let's say. And but did, did you do any creative? Did you do any creative studies, or you you sort of rolled into the creative part of architecture lighting? <laughs> well, I'm I'm this kind of autodidact, self taught person. Uh, from 14, when I was rolled into this kind of a passion for me, mm -hmm. I started to read the books in English, of course. Uh, mm -hmm. Richard Pilbro, uh, the books of. Uh, um, you know, whatever I could get my hands on. Uh, at that time, Plaza was kind of the mecca for entertainment lighting. So I went there and they had a bookshop there. So I always went home with lots of books. I, I read the magazines, Lighting Dimensions, Theatre Crafts International, Lighting and Sound International. Those were my mm -hmm. my Bibles. So I, I read them from back to forth and, and diagonally and, and all, yeah, yeah. all, all 
to be self-taught as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And so the only real education that I got was in architecture. It was my, uh, my uh, I didn't finish uh, that architectural school because, you know, at 21, you were mature at that time. Now it's 18. At that time, it was 21. And then you could start a business. Mm -hmm. So I, I was just going to school until I was able to, to open business. That's actually a path mm -hmm. I can. But you seem to have gone off in the direction of doing architectural lighting first, contrary to today where you're more into experience lighting, right? So if I look at your website, there's a lot of architectural. And if I look at the timeline that you post on your on your website, uh, it, it looks like you started really in architectural lighting. Is that correct? Uh, no, I really mean the, the, the real start of ACT was in entertainment lighting design. So really the fashion shows, the concerts, the corporate stuff, and also the first uh, son and lumières, you know, where, for the French, where we found the light shows on, on cathedrals and, and whatever it was. It was before video mapping was even a part. So we did that already quite in a long way. And because we were doing these kind of nice lighting, uh, you know, non-permanent uh, for a show on a cathedral or on a office building, the, 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 the question was from those uh, building managers, hey, you did a very nice job, can you do that also permanently? So I, I really uh, fuck to my first uh, real architectural job because I only used my entertainment tools to creating an architectural plan and it was completely destroyed by the uh, by the engineers because I used I mean for a simple facade like 180,000 watts of lights because I was using you know, big stadium lights with color changers yeah. and stuff in front of it. Uh, and I used 20 of them. Uh, so it was the Arena Vision. You must know that because that's from your time when you were at Philips. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. We use those kind of things to light up the facade because I wanted to get a dark blue on it through a yeah, yeah, yeah. So my first job was never built um, because the the CEO wanted it. The architects, engineers, and myself we couldn't agree on how to do it. So in the end, he just said it will be dark. So there is still this building in Luxembourg, very mm. nice building, which has no <laughs> facade lighting on it. And that's my mistake. <laughs> Funny because it, it, it reminds me of, of my own, but in reverse, because I, I started in architectural lighting, obviously with a background with Philips and all that, and I started architectural lighting. And at one point of time, I also ventured a little bit into stage lighting. And mm. my first job, uh, just a local community theater, but my backgrounds were fantastically lit. But it was really bad lighting for the actors because I forgot that there's also people there and I was actually lighting, <laughs> the, you know, the backdrop and the stage was really well architecturally lit. But um, yeah, there was a learning curve as well. So I can I can uh, understand where, you, where you're coming from. Yeah. Now, setting up, setting up your business is not everybody's uh, given thing to do, right? Because we, we learn maybe uh, design skills and you're self-taught, as you say, but Setting up a business also means that you need to understand the, the, the business administration of things. Um, by the looks of it, you had some partners and your collaborators that maybe helped you. How was your first experience of, of actually running a company? Because design is one thing, but also making sure that you can keep afloat is another story. Well, um, the uh, it, it's um, trial and error. Um, yeah. But let, let me first go to what, what I think is the most important thing, um, because there is the management of your firm, but there is also keep your firm, um, uh, you know, coherent to keep it relevant, actually. Yeah. And um, what, what I was saying, I started really in entertainment uh, lighting design, then went into architectural. And, and I can see this almost every five years, I rearrange or I re, you know, reposition or I, re, I redo something in the firm to keep it relevant. And that's why after 28 years, we, was, we're, we are still here. Uh, being in, a, in a, a little bit more innovative way, because I see a lot of my colleagues, uh, you know, doing solely and very, very good, pure architectural lighting, uh, even with 
only white lighting and stuff like that. So they are really, they, they got a yeah, niche yeah. out of themselves. And I think they became yeah. very, very relevant yeah. um, by, their, by, by their style. And like an artist has that thing. Um, I, I didn't really do that. I, I, I think I got bored quickly with what we were doing. I'm not just that character, maybe. Um, and so I, I always wanted to see what's you know what is out there, what's the next thing. So after architecture, video became a part of our you know tool sets, and after that, everything that had to do with special effects, uh, water, water is is my is actually my specialty. I think worldwide and. Most producers know me as the, you know the one that does magic with water. Um, that started with the um, with the dragon show that we did for the rev in, in the wind, which was a, you know a complete uh, swimming pool and all the all the sets and all the things come out of the water. So I kind of I learned a lot from doing that in 2005. Um, mm -hmm. But other other special effects like pyros and smoke and you know all those kind of things became the tool set with which we were creating. And that goes now uh, into what we call overall the experiential design, which is no longer just lighting, but it's it's the narrative into which lighting and video and sound and you know music and scores and uh, soundscapes, but also all the special effects and scenographies and elements that's you know the medium that you need to make something yeah. visible just gets this, you know, symbiotic kind of yeah, whole yeah. on this, you know. I'm but using you, a lot of in, you you sort of rolled into it to from I mean I'm looking at, at it from 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 a way, uh, but it feels to me that you 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 got you know you started in there and you got some other jobs and so gradually you really moved into this field of experiential of experience experience experiential design as you call it. Yeah. Um, well, for me, I never set out to become a lighting designer, specifically doing a lot of hospitality projects, but you do one, then you do another, and you get you sit nearly pigeonholed somewhere because of the sort of jobs that come your way. Um, and so I find it very uh, interesting to see how different lighting designers end up in different directions Maybe by coincidence, because they, they at one point of time during their, their journey, they came across a project that pushed them in a certain direction, and then you gradually build from there. And I find it fascinating to see what, what you have been doing. And, you know, you've got, you've got some really nice projects like uh, the, the Star in uh, Emotion, your, your Tree of Life. You got involved in Expos, uh, Olympic Games. Um, in fact, we probably crossed our path in several locations because you came to Singapore. Um, I saw that you also were in, in uh, CC in, in uh, China. I, I did hotels there. Um, so we were somewhere potentially walking in the same wetlands, but not knowing <laughs> from each other that we were there. Um, but yeah, so tell me a bit how that, how that journey went, because I find it quite fascinating to see how people just roll into a certain way. I mean, it's also your interest, I guess, because of your background, right? But um, yeah, I'm, I'm interested to hear how you really got further and further and basically deeper and deeper into this um, yeah. uh, interactive design. Um, it's, it, um, um, I think it's a coincidence on one hand, but it's also the choice of the clients. Um, I think um, we, we uh, I mean, fortunate or not unfortunately, we have never really had a business developer uh, into our midst. You know, we never had to really put a, a commercial person on the road for us to find work. We kind of, you know, it's always the phone ringing and we do, we, we do our marketing. So we, we put stuff on our website, we put stuff on our social media now. Exactly. Yeah. Um, for that, it was a newsletter. But except for that, we didn't do anything, and and we didn't go out. People just found us and called us, and so it was our clients that just always came up with these kind of things. Like, hey, we've got this crazy idea. We saw that you did this. What do you think? Do you think it's feasible? Is it possible? So it's it's that clients that were good clients, and that made um, a lot of the possibilities. Uh, what mm -hmm. we had in front of us, um, you know, reality, uh, because they had you know, kind of a um, trust. Um, 
but also a, a good sense of um, will make it. Uh, because I think it's um, if if I have to pride myself on one thing about ACTLD over the years is that we always delivered, always delivered under the on the most cruciating, cruciating, you know, most you know difficult circumstances we ever were. Where in the end we only had four hours during the during the day to program a whole show. Uh, you know, we still delivered the shows. Uh, mm -hmm. Nobody saw how it could have been if we had more time, but at least yeah, yeah, the yeah. public was there and saw what it was. So being able to deliver it, you know, as a guarantee has helped us to be with clients that gave us enough trust to be able to, you know, you know, to, to, to do these kind of crazy things and, and develop it from there. Yeah. So you you also got involved in uh, the Youth Olympic Games in Singapore. Uh, I think you did the opening and closing ceremony. Now I've tried to get involved in Olympic Games in China for the Beijing Olympic Games, and I was actually talking to architects and and did actually some preliminary design for the water tube. But in the end, it was so commercial uh, in that if you um, were not doing it for free. Basically, it was very hard to get in. Uh, so I just wonder what your experience was with uh, uh, the Olympic Games that you, you did in, in Singapore. Um, well, uh, Singapore was a specialty um, project in the way that um, a friend of mine in Singapore at some point just called me up, said, Kurt, you have to come to Singapore. And I cannot tell you why, uh, but you have to come. You really trust me on this. Uh, it was not a guy that I had already done like 10 projects with. It was more a um, kind of a, you know, it, we had a good feeling between one another. And so I literally took three days later the, the, the you know, the airplane to Singapore and he put me up in, in, in the hotel. Um, I think it was the Mandarin Hotel overlooking the, the Marina Bay. Mm -hmm. And then uh, he said, you yeah, you, you will meet two people downstairs in the lobby. Um, they will not introduce themselves. You will be, uh, mm. I will introduce you. I will talk yeah. five minutes and I will go away and they will start to ask you questions. And literally, that happened. So I sit there, they didn't, they didn't say who they were. Uh, they, all of a sudden, uh, they were talking to me about the possible show that they wanted to do that was supposed to be done on the Marina Bay. Uh, they didn't talk about Singapore Youth Olympic Games, nothing at all. And they asked me all of a sudden, you know, if we want to put a show on the bay in front of that, uh, the bleachers were already there, you know, in that football field, how do you want to do it? And I, you know, I, I, I tried to think about it and I said, listen, come with me because they yeah. put me up on the room on the 24th floor. So I, I took them up, the two guys that I didn't know. Mm -hmm. I opened yeah. up, you know, I put all the lights out, but they were looking at each other like, what the fuck is going on here? <laughs> and I, I, I showed them because the whole Marina Bay was in front of us. And I said, we have to work with a four-layer system here. You know, you've got mm -hmm. the stage. We got the actors layer one. You got the scenography that will be around it is layer two. We've got the water, which is layer three. Mm -hmm. We've got the skyline, which is layer four. And then on top of that, you can have the sky with, with the fireworks. Mm -hmm. I say, as long as we can light it in such a way that we can use and the water and the skyline and the, the usual things, which is the mm -hmm. actors and the, the, and the scenography, mm -hmm. that's going to work. And two days later, well, when, when we went down, one of them gave me my, his card. And that was the, um, you know, the president of the Singapore Youth Olympic uh, Games, you, you know, ceremonies. Uh, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. He was, was mm -hmm. a lieutenant colonel at that time. He became a general while he was doing it because it was the army actually organizing the. Uh, mm -hmm. And the other one was the artistic director. And uh, I only got to know that three days later that he was actually the artist. So they showed him in that kind of way. Um, it was, and it was paid. It was paid properly. There was no issues with that. Um, while most of them are really paid, but you got three levels. You got, uh, you know, the American level, eh, which is, if I have to put the number on it, three times what a European would, would, would ask. 
And then sometimes you got the guys that do it for free and that we literally do it for more than a uh, hotel. It's yeah. um, a game. It's a game. Yeah. Yeah, because I, I was working with the architects with with the idea that they would be employed and then suppliers came in. Um, mm. My old company. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so they would do it for free. Really good at that, huh? <laughs> Coming in like that. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, um, I still worked a bit on the master plan and, and it's quite a lot of things around it. But uh, yeah, it, I found it difficult and, and it was really quite uh, quite complicated to get in there because every uh, Tom, Dick and Harry wanted to be in there, of course. Um, the first, also one, had... very... the Sorry? first one is the most difficult one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, once because you're in there. They, this, yeah, they yeah. literally have a, um, a kind of a... Um, a condition uh, for doing opening ceremonies that you have had you 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 should have done one before. So mm. it's I mean how you get in to do your first one if you are not allowed exactly. to do anything. Yeah, you know? yeah, 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 yeah. It's, uh, it's oh. the first one is difficult. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I I also got involved in the World Expo in 2010 in in Shanghai. Um, you did uh, five years later in Italy, if I'm not mistaken. How did you get into that? Uh, my relationship with Marco Balic. Uh, I've got, I've got a really good relationship with Marco, uh, and you know, like three, four other important artistic directors around the world. Mm. There are jobs that they really like to do with me, so it's it's them actually uh, hiring me on the on these kind of projects. Um, Usually, already very early on, I get I get um, involved in a lot of competitions. Uh, with them, um, in some competitions, I don't need to do anything. In some, I I need to you know really deliver already a concept, visuals, whatever it's going to be. Um, mm -hmm. But while they are presenting and they are really doing their their pitch, um, they are the ones who are hiring uh, me into this kind of thing. And there are really like three or four you know acceptable producers worldwide. That that can do the you know that kind of ceremonies, um, and Balic is uh, is the best one. I, I feel oh, okay. for me, uh, you know, it's your world. Me. I'm not familiar with that. <laughs> I trust you. I trust you. So, um, so it's interesting because you you mentioned that you were doing. Can I say call, call it speculative design? If you create concepts for a competition or for being getting appointed into some of these jobs? Is that oh, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, I would say that, um, uh, you know, uh, two thirds of our work is, is straightforward commissioned work uh, by offer alone. One third always plays, the, the competition really plays a role. Um, Luckily today, the, the I mean, the, they have stepped away from the non-paid, uh, you know, work. Uh, the, there is at least some, a little bit of money uh, to pay for the competitions that they are putting together. Uh, then we are, you know, then we are mostly agreeing to work on the competition. If there is absolutely no money, they will, you want, they want, they want you to do everything for free. Then. You know, we we maybe take one or two a year in in mm. that in that phase, mm. and if it's really something that we really want to do, you know, yeah, yeah. Because, yeah, yeah. I mean, a competition that you do easily, you 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 invest ten twenty thousand euros uh, into a competition if yeah. you want to yeah. do it properly, and and I'm not talking neon style kind of, uh, you know. Uh, Concepts. I'm talking much smaller things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, you cannot um, you cannot survive doing non-paid competitions. Um, I don't think. I mean, I couldn't. I, that's for sure. Well, I mean, let's face it. Uh, creativity is our bread and butter. We we that is what we deal in, right? With creativity, our time. So um, I always found it difficult. I have also in my life accepted a few, but generally, I feel that if if they don't pay, even if it's speculative, it's sometimes a mm. hard call. And there, there are projects that you would love to do, uh, but then you look at the conditions and, and and all that, and then you have to make a decision whether you want the invested time and money or not. And, and uh, yeah. yeah, sometimes you do, 
but most of the time, um, it, for my side at least, no, I, I find it very difficult. Um, okay, so now something else. Uh, if, if I want to hop further down, you, you did this um, star in motion in, in, in Saudi Arabia. Um, that is not your usual art of, you know, thing that you would do, hanging something higher in the sky. Ah, yeah. Uh, that's how it's called, right? Your, is it called Star Emotion? Star Emotion, yeah. yeah well, yeah. Um, first of all, I, I want to intervene saying that uh, light art installations have been a real part of our portfolio since 2010. Uh, when we yeah. came out with Oho and uh, the, the Wooden Egg, um, that was our first real introduction into, into light art. Um, and it, it has been... Uh, well, success since then. Sometimes our stuff is put in a, in a garden of a of a really rich person <laughs> that I cannot yeah, yeah, yeah. at it. Uh, but uh, but having it, um, I mean, having been part of the North Festival um, that didn't come as a surprise to me. I, I think I, I've got a place to be in, in the competition to be an artist there. On the other hand. Um, the fact that they gave me that the site and asked me um, what would I like to do with it, I mean that was you know that that was okay you know that was my thing and that's also the curator who, who knows my work from entertainment and architectural and said if somebody can do something with that tower it's Kurt that was the the thing that because the, they they gave me three sites to to look at. Um, and um, but the first one was that one, and I kind of in ten minutes when I was talking with the curator, I came up with the idea already to, to, to do this, yeah, yeah. this kind of thing. Um, mm. So we didn't even talk about two other um, uh, locations anymore. She was happy with the you know with the um, the idea that I gave, and she, and she said, "Can you do a little bit of a sketch?" Uh, on this, so we can present it internally to the team, and then you know we did that, and then three weeks later she said it's done. Um, make a, a visual, so we made some visuals out of that, and then uh, it's we didn't hear anything anymore until three months later, after which they said it's too expensive. We need to see how to do it, and then in the end they put money on top of it uh, to make it happen, and then and then all of a sudden that star was hanging there at 273 meters high. But it seems that, that in these kind of experienced lighting designs, there's a bit more budget available. Um, I'm always struggling with my clients. They always value engineer everything. Now, you just said that they also uh, wanted you to, to reduce costs. But in the end, you know, these are events that they want to make happen. Uh, and they're somehow probably also timeline related so it's not like you can debate forever at one point of time you have to you know uh, uh freeze the design and say well we have to go ahead whatever it costs um so i don't know what your experience is with with budgets and value engineering because some of it you know some of it are temporary installations uh and sometimes people spend quite a lot of money for just a temporary installation while when you talk about a, a permanent installation, you would sometimes think, well, that needs to be durable, so we need to spend a bit more money here. Um, yeah. so they, I feel that sometimes it's a bit of a contradiction when you talk money in terms of, of these kind of applications. Uh, yeah, I don't have a, a rule of thumb on this. It's, um, um... I'm more talking about your experience as you know, you've gone through all these projects and obviously at one point of time, your clients say, hey, hold on, um, that's too much. And in the end, they still pay it, maybe or maybe not. And I'm not more talk about your experience in dealing with governments, with with uh, authorities, with clients, when it comes to to the money side of things. Well, um, I, I think you have to show them at some point where that money goes to. I mean, that's the easiest way. You know, if you put, you know, the star is here and it's three million dollars. It wasn't that, but I'm just giving it a thing. Well, then, of course, because every, I mean, every producer, every promoter has has an idea what you do. I go see a show. Um, I saw the ABBA show. I can put a money figure on that. I can put a money figure on that. 
I know how much would it cost to create, to do the content, because I've got that experience. So they, they have lots of experience. They know when they see something, their, expect, their expectation is, is uh, one million. You know? um, but it's based on whatever they have been doing yeah. uh, in, in their world. Mm. Uh, and they never tell me their expectation. You know, they, they, that's the biggest fault, I think, that most of the promoters, uh, construction companies, uh, you know, developers, and things can make. They always yeah. think we're going to be cheaper than what they had in their hands and that they're going to make a good deal, which is never the case. Never. Because the, yeah. there is this conundrum that you have where if you don't know a budget, either yeah. you are very expensive and the guy says, whoa, they're megalomanic guys, uh, crazy, never want to work with them again. Or you are so much under their budget that they think those guys, they don't know what I want, they're not ambitious enough. So they also, yeah. you're always, if you see Kate, if you are not given a direction of where the money should go. Mm -hmm. So I insist a lot, mm -hmm. or I work with them on benchmarks. I work with mm -hmm. them, I say, listen, this project that we did here was about that money. Is that where you think you should be? That's the expectations mm -hmm. that you have. So managing yeah. your expectations is very, and when you are very far mm -hmm. away from each other, then I start to really explain where the money goes to. I say, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of doing that thing over there, um, um, and I can be frank about that without giving the real numbers, that is that almost 55% of all the money of the whole production went to the rigging, just to the rigging, mm -hmm. just to those four cables <laughs> yeah. going up and Spend, yeah. holding the thing in its place. Uh, only 30% went to the uh, construction of the star itself, and, which is a big piece, uh, six and a half meters in diameter, all the lighting, all the pieces, it's a mm -hmm. uh, six yeah. and a half equipment. It's it's said that only 30% of the money went there. Uh, mm -hmm. And 50% went to production and, uh, you know, the, all, all the ocean bank that you have around that. But 55 went to the cables, you know, the talking cable. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I can... <laughs> yeah, a lot. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So talk about art, you also did your OVO sphere, which sort of traveled around the world, if I if I understood that correctly. Yeah. You developed an artwork for a certain purpose or maybe a certain event, and then it started traveling around the world. Tell us a bit about that. Uh, well, everybody who's old enough uh, remembers 2008 when we had the credit crunch uh, at, the, at the second part of 2008. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we were at that point doing a lot of retail real estate. And so in about three months, we went from 12 projects that we had to do to one and a half. So we had some time left. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, the idea came to uh, why won't we do something with uh, an, art, an art installation? It's been on my mind since four years. Because I think in 2006, I did Lyon, Les, Les Fêtes de Lumière, for the first time with a dance and a light art installation, but which was completely ephemeral. It was completely, uh, you know, just stock stuff and put it together over there with yeah, yeah. But the um, but so so my, you know, my restless mind was already busy with that. So in 2009, we kind of developed that collaboration uh, with the sculptors and us to make this thing, uh, the oval sculpture. And it was from the idea to really put it out there on the uh, on, on a platform, on an artistic platform, so that we could put it in a lots of different locations. So I think we did 16, I think, locations uh, in, you know, from China, Mongolia to, to the US. Um, mm. and, and we stopped when it was literally almost falling apart because every time you screw it in, you have to screw it out and then the whole yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. At some point we, it's, uh, you know. Where, and it, where is it now? In storage? <laughs> it, it's in a garden of somebody, yeah. <laughs> the, uh, but Burning Man even asked us to put it uh, at Burning Man, but they asked me to, to burn it down at the end. And I said, no, you can't do that. All the LEDs that, you know, you, you, you make, it's not very healthy eh, to, to burn all the uh, CPUs and all the LEDs and, and all the cabling and all the wiring and all stuff like that. I said, especially because it was made to travel. So 
the whole thing came was completely disassembled only with pieces. Mm-hmm. We had two little slide cases of, of lighting equipment, and we had three pallets, uh, small pallets, uh, 120 by 80, um, mm-hmm. of, of wood. So it, it literally went into, uh, with a little bit of struggle, it, you could put it into this kind of C4, you know, those little little vans. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, could, yeah. It, it fit oh, in, cool. two, uh, in two airport, air, air, you know, air um, containers, you know, the ones that you use for, okay. with, for air travel. It, it fit in there. It was made to really be very compact uh, mm-hmm. to be able to travel around the world. And they asked me to burn it. And I said, no, no, I'm no, no, not doing it. I don't want to do that. It, it's, it's At least somebody's funny. happy because he's in, in his garden. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I also want to ask you, ask you about um, uh, Puy du Fou. Um, I, I've seen that yeah. also multiple times. And, and I think that's an ongoing thing that keeps going. Um, yeah. Tell me a bit about that. Um, you know, I, I love France, and I think you also have a big affinity with France. Um, what's Puy oh, yeah. Fou? Well, I, 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 I think I visited uh, Puy Fou in 2008 at some point uh, in a conference calling kind of thing. And so I was kind of impressed with them. Um, but I think it was in 2011 that Puy Fou um, got a prize. A TEA prize or IAPA prize, you know, for the team entertainment markets and stuff like that. So, so they went to Vegas for the first time, and so um, the original founder, Philippe uh, de Villiers, and his son uh, Nicolas, who is today the artistic director and also the president and the chairman, and like everything, um, he they went to Vegas and they went to see a few shows. One of them was the, the Red, and they saw the Red show at that, at that moment. And they were, you know, very impressed with that show. And they went into the book and they saw who's this guy that did the lighting. And uh, and so they were calling up people uh, in, in front. Who knows who? Well, how can we get in touch with, with with Kurt? You know. And so somebody knew me. Then I was introduced, and they said you have to come immediately to Pretty Foo. And I went there, and they gave me the royal treatment on everything. <laughs> And um, so they, they set me down to see the Sydney City show that I, that I had seen five years before. And at the end of that thing, they were, they were gathering around me with eight people and they were like, so what did you think about the show? <laughs> so that's a, a catch 22, like we say. You can, you can only do, say bad things. You know, if you say everything is good, they won't hire you. Uh, because they say he doesn't have anything to say. If you yeah. say too much of the things that you think is wrong with it, they will take it personally because they are also <laughs> they are the creators yeah. of the show. So you're you really like you know you're on yeah. the court, the thing, and on a bicycle yeah. at the same time with a monkey on your head, balancing mm-hmm. to really find the right words to tell them what is really good about it and what is what, what could be better developed. And, yeah. and I, I so I, I I did the rope and um, and they uh, they literally at the end of the session they said we're gonna work with you um, we will have our people call your people for the money and uh, but can you come back uh, in two weeks we have to start working and and that was 2012 was the first year that we done in 2011 we started working already 2012 was the first iteration. The job is so humongous that the lighting design concept that I proposed had to be done over four years uh, because it's a huge investment. I mean, the stage is 250 meters wide, 110 meters deep. It's it's three football fields uh, plus, you know, 3,000 actors on stage. I mean, it's it's a lot. And also every year they do new stuff. So that was the thing in them. From that project came the other one, and then the other one, and the other one. So we kind of, you know, we are, we've been together for ten years. Um, now the, the the COVID pandemic was really hard for them. So they, uh, oh, yeah, they I can are, imagine. Yeah, really, really, uh, they have not yet, you know, recovered completely from this. That's why you will see a delay in most of the projects that have 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 come in terms of the development. Um, uh, you know, Nicola told me three years of delay uh, because of that one yeah, that was a year and a half of, uh, of of COVID that was really hard for them. But it's the same. Like, 
you, you also see in Macau that it's still not to the level what it was before, and all the yeah. projects in Macau have also been uh, been delayed uh, or put on hold indefinitely. So, you said your retirement project, something that you will be doing until you retire. <laughs> uh, well, you know, a, a while ago there was this um, hotel in space kind of thing where they wanted to put mm. a hotel in. And they were looking for people to work with uh, with them, and we kind of put ourselves on their list for doing the lighting design of uh, the that you know roundabout yeah, yeah. hotel. Is that's something I I kind of still like to do? Yeah, something really and go up there, of course, with commission. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's the thing. Yeah. Now it's um I don't know I, when I was really just starting my young career I I kind of made a bucket list so I wanted to do um, I wanted to do an Olympic ceremony I wanted to do a big show in Vegas I wanted to do something on Broadway I wanted to do a big tour and you know I got five things out of it there's one thing that I still have to do um, all the rest I've been able to do over the course of my years so yeah. I'm. I think I'm 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 very fortunate to already be having been able to do so many things yeah. on my budget. Yeah. You know, if if you look back, if you look back, what would be your your most satisfying project? I mean, I, if you go to your website, there's so many projects there. Seems to me hard to choose, but maybe you have a favorite or a few favorites that you have done over yeah. the years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's 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 a very nice question. It's really like saying, whom of your babies do you like the most? It's a, you know, as a parent, you know, you you can't say that in public, uh, because either your clients or your people or your your mother will say, who, what are you doing? I always like to say the the one that we're doing next year. Hmm. Uh, because I've got a very. You know, it's maybe not the nicest thing to say, but you're only as relevant and as as good as your last project. Mm -hmm. um, we are in a very fast-paced world. Whatever I did ten years ago, it's a memory. You know, it's yeah. it's no longer relevant for people to choose you anymore. You know, it's what you have done in the last four or five years. That that's mm -hmm. that's what makes it relevant. I think. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I mean, I can't say over. 20 or 34 years of really doing projects what, what i like the most one uh, mm. but the um so, so the relevance is, is is one thing but if you i thought you were going to ask me if i if i would change something in the course of my career what would it have been <laughs> yeah, yeah i, I, I was, i'm not getting there yet but yes that's one of the things that i wanted to ask if there's one point of time you wanted to change direction or things that you wanted to change so um, no, yeah, really, I, I did want to ask that. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, because that's uh, something I've been um, talking about a lot when I'm interviewing people or I'm, you know, uh, talking to the younger people. Uh, mm -hmm. That is one thing I've never worked for somebody else. In my, I mean, I've mm -hmm. worked my whole life for somebody else, but I could choose who it was, whether it's the artistic director or the promoter or whatever. If I didn't have a good feeling with him, I could yeah. say, get away. Uh, but they were never in control of, of my work. You know, they are, um, they can say, I love it, I use it, or I don't, but you were working for a boss, like all these people here in this office working for this company and this style and this thing. Um, I, I miss that. I miss the fact that I've never had that experience of working for somebody else with their vision, their mentality, and having to adapt myself to, to that on a consistent basis, uh, but also to not really having a mentor um, uh, following me in the in, in the youth of my career. Uh, I mean, there, uh, I, I, I mean, I can see what I sometimes can do with people that are here, and I mentor them, and I, you know, I put them into their paces, and sometimes it's hard, but uh, but sometimes it's really also very very good and and building a company is not that easy I've, I've seen some people leave this here and say i want to create my own company and three years later they were that company didn't exist anymore they were working again for another firm which is okay eh? because we cannot all be entrepreneurs and designers and commercial people at the same time and it's 
it's those three things together that that you have to have in you to make a company work uh, entrepreneurship uh, your, your talent as a designer and uh, you have to be able to sell yourself uh, yourself and, and your company so not everybody has that and I, I've warned some people I say listen you're too soon stay another two years here you can go into the senior role you can have more experience by how to handle clients and see this kind of things and uh, well they said no and they went out it didn't work out so, and you know those things happen but I feel that if I would have had a mentor a little early on in my career, I, I would not have made so many business mistakes that I've done. Uh, um, <laughs> I, I'm laughing because different one. I'm laughing because I obviously worked for Philips for 12 years before I started my own. So in a way, I did the route that you just described. I, I, I spent 12 years with Philips having a mentor, having a boss telling me how and what and trying to make up my own thing before I started my own. Um, to say that that has really helped me to become a better business person, uh, no, because I had to learn it the, half, the hard way when I started my, on, on my own. Um, but I can understand where you're coming from, but there's no guarantee that that would have helped things in a better way. Sometimes you learn things the hard way when you're self-responsible rather than other people are responsible for it, right? Yeah. So to me, I felt that I learned more by being on my own than being. Yes, of course, I learned. I learned the ropes and the basic things when I was in Philips, and you know there was different designers, and I would learn uh, what one did and what the other did, and you pick and choose and say, okay, I like this, I like that, and you, you create your own identity, as it were, as a designer. But um, I really learned the ropes of lighting design when I was on my own, because that's when you really have to make the decisions and you're not always can rely on other people. It's just down to you. You have to call it out and, and say, okay, this is how we're going to do it. Even if you're not totally confident. So um, yes, then no, I understand where you're coming from. But I, I'm not sure where that would have helped a lot, uh, but it gave me a lot of insight, of course, in the manufacturer's side of how things are developing. So now, but you leave too long, man. You stayed too long man, after Philip said. You stayed much too long. Twelve years is too long to stay. Yeah, there. but I've done I've done more than thirty years on my own already. So <laughs> no, that's okay. But I think the mentorship that I'm talking about is something that I think you take with me for three to five years. Yeah, uh, yeah. It, I'm talking a lot about how to pro edit the processes in a company. Mm. I mean, the moment we start to have personnel and they were asking us to do, inter, you know, evaluation, um, you know, yearly evaluation. Never, never done that before. Yeah. Never knew how to do it. So, mm. but trial and error after a few years, you know how to do it. If you have been in a company before, that process of how to do an interview You've been you, you've done it yourself with your with, with that person. You would have had you know the process and the documentation that goes with it in a yeah, yeah. kind of. Yeah. That's what I'm doing. Business. Th those twelve years were not spent. Twelve years in the same division or the same department. I started with the light design division. Then I was posted in France, where I spent two three years. Then I went back to to Holland for two years. Then I was posted in Singapore for two three years. So it, it was. A, a, a bunch of different experiences but yeah you could argue but sometimes you follow the flow and when it's time it's time it comes yep. at different times different people um what i want to say is that we, we are living in a totally different world so with social media and and you know uh interactiveness in in uh, the, the mobility that we have um when when i started at least we, we didn't even have a mobile phone we didn't have computers i, I was on the drafting table you had the only computer that I knew was a big mainframe computer, a few uh, a few rooms further down our department where you had to uh, do punch cards and then overnight, uh, hopefully you got some lighting calculations out. Um, today, we live in a totally different world. Is that affecting you in the way, because you've been around for a long time, you, you've known the nearly pre-social media uh, time era. Um, how does that affect you in your daily life? The way you do your approach Things differently. Um, well, um, the, the approach. No, I don't think the approach we do is differently. I think we are more efficient. 
um, mm. by using all the digital tools that we have at our disposal, uh, especially with the added digital knowledge with whom the people come in now. Um, at some point, there was this discrepancy that we had between what we were using here in the office and new people coming in, lacking a lot of knowledge about those tools. Yeah? AutoCAD was a premise. Who really knew AutoCAD really well, yeah. coming out of Wismar even or whatever. Um, yeah. you know, at some point for, for about five to seven years, there was this really discrepancy where we, we, we had to uh, educate the people yeah. using those tools. Now, nowadays they come in, they have those uh, digital knowledge so well under control that even if there's a new tool they don't know yet, in a, in a week they are adapting to it. Um, yeah. So, the, so what, what, what we do now with 12 people is what I needed to do before with 20, uh, to get in the same amount of time, the same amount of output. Um, and I think that will even speed up more once we will be you know, effectively putting uh, all the AI tools into our daily processes that we have. And so we are, we are, we are playing with that at the moment. Um, and I think the design itself will benefit from a lot of AI, but I think mostly the business will, 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 I see a lot of help in the business where I can, where I can spend less time on administration and jar and marketing and all those kind of things and spend more time on projects if I can get you know um, if I can get 30% of my time back from all those things and I can mm. put that back to my uh, in, into my projects or in my business in my business development that I do with, with clients that that's the benefit that will happen that, of that I'm sure right right so if you look back what do you think your legacy would be if you look back at all your years of, and you still have a lot of years ahead of you for sure, um, but do you think you're, you're going to leave a legacy to the new generation? Jesus, man. Now you really <laughs> made, made me think about dying. So that's what, <laughs> you have to warn me about this. It's a, <laughs> it's a, I have no, no, it's not, no it's not easy question, I, but sometimes I, I, we, we do things. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I don't have children of my own. Uh, um, my my wife now has a child, and I, you know, I mean, it's both both beau, beau pair. You say that uh, stepfather, and you know, so I've had the chance to really be. But but I, I don't think it's up to me to decide what what will be my legacy. I think it's to the legacies that will decide what will be what what they have taken from me uh, or what they have learned from me and I think it's to the one that is going to write my eulogy that it's going to be the, <laughs> the narrator of the legacy that I'm doing and I don't want to I don't want to talk I don't want to I don't want to say that yeah you still you still have too much passion to yeah to I, still, I, really, do I still have a lot of things to do man before yeah. I'm over here yeah <laughs> still have well even that's much. fantastic isn't that fantastic that, I mean, I've got the same thing. I mean, I'm, I'm approaching 70 and I'm like, wow, I've got still so many things I want to do, right? Oh, yeah. and, I think, yeah. and, I, and I think that's, that's the great thing about our, our job uh, or our discipline of lighting design. There's still so much things and, and the technology keep evolving and there are new opportunities. And um, to me, uh, it's, it's really... I mean, it drives me every day still, uh, even though I'm trying to to calm down a bit and I'm now a grandfather as well. So there's other things to, to look after as well. But um, it's still something that drives me every day. And I can imagine that for you also, there's still uh, so much out there to do. Uh, I know you uh, know your, your passion. Uh, we've met several times uh, over, over the years and it's always been a pleasure. Um, thank you for for this for this chat. Uh, we we generally end up with a rhetorical question, um, which I wanted to ask you. If there's a, a question that you would like to ask me or would like to put out to our community, uh, what would that be? Oh, my favorite question, uh, and um, I want to bring that to the younger uh, public: mm -hmm. is 
where do you see yourself in 10 years? Mm -hmm. It's the typical well, question that, that, that we always get on interviews. Eh? It's a mm -hmm. very hard question. It's a, such yeah. a hard question to respond to. If you can imagine, and for me, the, the you know, the, the I'm going to say it like this. For me, the one that can answer anything on that question is somebody that really has a vision of how it could be, you know, not how, but he, he, he can think. Mm -hmm. um, and it's the, you know, it's the kind of a trick question that you put into somebody uh, if he can find a methodology to get there, you know, that's the kind of thing. So whoever can tell me how he sees the, the, how he sees the future for him and for our industry in 10 years, I will definitely call him up for an interview. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I I know it's a difficult question, and and for me it's also you know I I've been in this business for more than forty years, and to look ahead is also very difficult. But one thing I do know is that I have so much knowledge, you know, uh, uh, assembled over all these years. That one of the things that I'd love to do right now is to share that uh, at least uh, in 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 a way which we do with with the LDC, obviously. But also through my own uh, Light Talk platform, where we're trying to share the knowledge and, and help the the older gen, the newer generation, I should say, um, with with you know at least things they can pick up from. It doesn't need to say that what I say is the way it should be, but these are my experiences. And sometimes you pick up one little thing from somebody um, that helps you, you know, uh, sort of uh, form yourself, uh, finding yourself. Uh, and I think that's something. And one of the biggest things that I have found, and if, if I look at your question, is that we we somehow should be prepared to go with the flow because we don't know what what the future brings. We know general directions. We know a bit how the technology develops. But 15 years ago, I had no idea about social media. And now suddenly we're posting stuff from social media, which so you adapt to your environment. And I think adaptability uh, and and being willing to learn um, and educate yourself about what is possible, I think, is part of the journey that you embark in uh, towards the future. You can't say, indeed, what the future is or will be, but very often, I also like to say, you often know what you don't want, so that eliminates a number of things as well and sort of fine-tunes a bit your direction. Um, but what is exactly along that path forward? No, we don't know. But uh, as long as we are open and, and willing to, to um, explore the opportunities that come our way, um, I think uh, we still both have a big future ahead and a long future ahead. Maybe we should make an appointment for when we're both 80 or 90 or something and see where, <laughs> where we're at in our careers. I hope to still be around. Maybe not as active as today, but uh, certainly um, it's something that uh, I want to uh, keep uh, keep doing. Kurt, yeah. thank you so much for this uh, this chat. It has been a real pleasure to chat with you. Uh, I hope to see you in in real life somewhere in this world soon. Um, and uh, till then, thank you so much. Well, you couldn't have said it better. Thank you, Martin. And that concludes our interview with Kurt Vermeulen, a true lighting hero. We hope you enjoyed getting to know Kurt on a more personal level and gaining valuable insights from his journey in lighting design. If you found this episode inspiring, we encourage you to subscribe to the Virtual Lighting Design Community Podcast and our online platform and share it with your friends and colleagues. Your support means the world to us and it helps us bring you more amazing guests and content. Don't forget to leave a glowing review and comment below to let us know your thoughts and suggestions. Thank you to our premium supporters once again. They are Aero Light, Creative Lighting Asia, Erco, and the Signify Lighting Academy for their continued support. And remember to stay connected with our vibrant lighting community and never miss an episode. Visit www.vld.community. Join us on this continued journey through the world of professional lighting design. Until next time, keep shining bright.